The Green Hornet. He hunts the biggest of all game, public enemies who try to destroy our America. his faithful valet, Cato, Britt Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with racketeers and saboteurs, risking his life that criminals and enemy spies will feel the weight of the law by the sting of the Green Hornet. Ride with Britt Reed in the thrilling adventure, Fog in the Night. The Green Hornet strikes again. How long has it been since you've taken one of your old books down off the shelf to read? Why don't you take some of those old timers out, dust them off, and send them to the Merchant Marine Library? Our Merchant Marines have some pretty long hours to put in aboard the cargo ships, and reading an interesting book is about the only recreation they have. When these boys are off duty, a book to read will go a long way toward helping them forget the ever-present danger of torpedoes. The seamen report that the books they like best are biographies, westerns, novels, and mysteries. Now, you probably have a lot of books in your home that you've enjoyed reading and probably won't be reading again. How about wrapping them up and mailing them to the Merchant Marine Library, New York City? Or if you live west of the Mississippi, send them to the Merchant Marine Library, San Francisco. And now, the Green Hornet. <laughs> large truck of the semi-trailer type, heavily loaded with parts for one of the war factories, pulled slowly over the crest of a hill to the west of the city. The weather was cold and the road inclined to be icy in spots. In the cab of the truck, the driver was talking to his helper. This uh, night driving ain't all it's cracked up to be, especially in weather like this. You gotta watch out for bad spots in the road. I'll take this hill we're going down now, for instance. Halfway down here, there's a hairpin turn that's slippery as the devil. You gotta go into creep gear to get around it without going over into the gulch. I ain't been on this route before. It's a good thing you're doing the driving. Yeah, but even at that, I don't feel safe when I get past that turn. Especially with ten ton like this shoving us along. Well, we're almost there now. I guess I better slow her down. Any trucks ever go over there? Nah. Believe you me, that's one place we all watch our step. After we get around that, the road's fairly straight. Oh, there's a beginning of the turn coming up ahead of us. Hey, what's that? Look, what the thick fog rolling across the road. Hey, we're getting right in it. Watch out, use the brakes. I can't see, we're sliding. We'll do something quick, we'll go through the rail. Hey, I'm driving blind, that fog. I... They're skidding, look out! following morning, in the office of Britt Reed, publisher of the Daily Sentinel, Lowry, one of the reporters, was discussing the accident of the night before. Oh, sure it was a rotten break for the two men on that truck, Chief. Neither one of them lived to tell about it. Yeah, Lowry, it's too bad. I guess the driver of the truck was a little careless in taking that turn. Some of them got that way after they've been over the same road a lot. Yeah. Funny, though. It was a nice, clear night. You know, Chief, that sure was a long drop into that gully after the truck went through the guardrail. Oh, did you see the wreckage? Oh, sure, I was out there this morning. <laughs> Some mess. I noticed your story in the Sentinel said the truck was carrying parts for one of the local war factories. Yeah, that's right. Some sort of steel rods that are used in making tanks. Well, they were all bent up and scattered all over the gully. Well, that's the kind of thing that'd cheer up the Nazis. Yeah. 
That's a break for them without them having to do anything to make it happen. I don't suppose the brakes on that truck could have been tampered with or anything like that. No, no, it was near the end of their run. No, they'd have noticed if anything was wrong with the brakes long before they got to that curve. Well, like you said, they just got careless, I guess. Once too often. Well, to use a trite phrase, accidents will happen. But too many accidents like that one would result in a serious slowdown in production at that war factory. Well, let's hope that accident will make other drivers along that route more careful in the future. Meanwhile... In a deserted-looking house well back from the road on the west side, just outside the city, a tall, blonde man stood with glass in hand, smiling down at his sober-faced companion who sat nearby. So, I drink to the success of your ingenious little invention, Hans. Just to think, by its use, we have kept 20 tons of vital steel rods from reaching that factory. I'm glad our plans have been so successful, Fritz. The simple little device we use is not such an ingenious invention as you think. But it has served the purpose. However, I think it prudent not to use it again for a week or so, especially at the same point in the road. Uh, you overly cautious, Hans. That is the only logical place along the highway to use it. The turns are so sharp that drivers have no chance to avoid having, well, shall we say, an accident when they are momentarily blinded by our fog in the night. Huh? You're the one who gives the orders, of course. Yes, my dear Hans, I do give the orders. Of course. And I, a person of education and breeding, have to take them. Because you were a member of the elite guard of the Nazi party. Stop it! You would dare to insinuate that I, your superior, am not educated and well-bred. Why, you, you... Wait. Be careful what you say, Fritz. And for splattering me with wine from that broken glass, I won't forget. The only common bond between us is that we're both Nazis. <laughs> Come, Hansi. We will overlook our differences, huh? We have work to do here in America. Uh, tomorrow night, we will go to promote another accident. Then we will lay low for a while. Hmm? Ah, you'll learn someday that there are smart men even in this country. One of them may see through our so-called accidents. Perhaps you do have a good brain, Hans, but you lack what these Americans call nerve. Now then, tomorrow night... Another load of vital war material will crash into that gully. And the Allies will be that much farther from the victory they are so anxious to achieve. Hello, Casey. How's our little ray of sunshine this fine morning? If you don't ease up on your noisy entrances around here, Axford, this little ray of sunshine will turn into a thundercloud. Ah, wish no. <laughs> Is that any way to return a cheery greeting from a fellow worker? Fellow workers are like relatives. We have to put up with them, but we don't pick them. It's not something, though, when a girl can't get along with her relatives and fellow workers either. <laughs> Tis sorry I am for you. Get out of here. Hold on, now. Don't go throwing that paperweight. I'm going right now. I go and see Reed. What's going on, Axford? Somebody chasing you? Oh, glory be. <laughs> that Casey gets worse by the minute. What little Irish she might have in her all went into her temper. <laughs> well, someday you'll learn to let Miss Case alone. Anything new on those accidents? Well, I guess you saw the story in the morning edition about the accident last night. Oh, yes, it was just about the same as the other one, except that one of the men on the truck was still alive. Yeah. I went over to the hospital this morning with Sergeant Burke. I phoned Gunningham from there a while ago. The poor guy didn't pull through. Oh, too bad. And he wasn't able to give any light on the accident, I suppose? Nope, he was unconscious all night. This morning he began mumbling, sort of delirious, you know. Kept saying something about not being able to see because of the fog. Just said the same thing over and over for a while, and then he just passed on. I guess his injuries affected his eyesight in some way. The doc said the guy didn't know what he was talking about at all. Just raving on, as you might say. That's strange that those heavy trailer trucks have been using that road right along without any trouble. Well, of course, that curve is pretty icy in weather like this. Well, we've had this kind of weather for over a month. The last time I drove over that road, I noticed some sand had been put on the curve. Sure. But with a big, heavy truck, it takes more than a little sand to keep it from slipping if it's moving too fast. Oh, that's true. Oh, hello, Laurie. Come right on in. Hi, Chief. Hi, Axford. Hi, yourself, Laurie. You got a scoop, I suppose. Oh, if we came in to see the chief only when we had a scoop, uh, you'd never be in here. Say, now, I'll have you know I... Take it easy, you two. <laughs> have you been in to see Gunnigan this morning, Lowry? He was looking for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I just came from the city room, chief. I gave in the details on a takeoff crash at the airport. 
crash at the airport, huh? Anybody hurt? Well, the two guys in it were shaken up a bit, but that's all. They got away from the plane just in time, though. It caught fire. So the plane was lost, huh? Well, they managed to save it so it can be repaired. Boy, those fellows on that fire wagon out there sure know their stuff. Where did they get water way out there in the field, I'd like to know? Huh. That shows what you know, Axford. They didn't need water. I suppose they just beat the fire out with their hatchet, have us believe. Is that <laughs> it? <laughs> Don't keep him in suspense, Lowry. Well, they used an extinguisher that shot out a big cloud of stuff. You know, uh, a vapor? Yeah, yeah, like a big cloud of white fog, you might say. Oh, it snuffed out that fire in no time. I see. Yes, I've seen that used before. It's very effective for putting out fires. Very effective. Well, you two'd better get out and dig up some more news. We've got a paper to keep going, you know. Anyway, I've got a lot to think about this morning. A lot to think about. That evening, Britt Reed arrived at his apartment, where Cato, his faithful valet, and the only person knowing his identity as the Green Hornet, was waiting. I have a feeling something worry you, Mr. Britt. What gives you that idea, Cato? You not act calm and rest easy like Britt Reed, young man about town. You restless, have gleam of green hornet in eyes. I've been doing a lot of thinking about those truck accidents on the West Highway. You suspect they're not accidents, perhaps? Well, I don't really know, but I'd like to find out. All we have to do is to decide just where and how to start. If I may suggest, perhaps the best place to start is where trucks have fatal ending. We agree on that. Got the mask and the gas gun, Kato. We'll take the Black Beauty and see what we can turn up. I've had a thought in my mind all day. Perhaps we can find some proof that what I've been thinking of would be feasible. And in that case, you and the Green Hornet may run into some real trouble before the night's over. Stepping through a secret panel in the rear of a closet in his bedroom, Britt Reed and Cato went along a narrow passageway built within the walls of the apartment house itself. This passage led to an adjoining building which fronted on a dark side street. Though supposedly abandoned, this building served as the hiding place for the sleek, super-powered Black Beauty, streamlined car of the Green Hornet. Britt Reed pressed a button. The great car roared into life. A section of the wall in front raised automatically, then closed as the gleaming Black Beauty sped into the darkness. back road to the top of that hill is pretty rough, but it affords a good hiding place for our cars so that we can reach it easily by that footpath on the highway. Why do we come so early? These trucks seem to run past there about the same time every night. Your caution is contagious, my dear Hans. I want to make sure the way is clear. If they should get the idea of posting a guard at that point to warn the trucks of danger, we could not do what we have set out to do. That is, without disposing of the guard first. The moonlight's very bright tonight already see where we leave the car. Yes, that's the place. We'll stop now. Come. <laughs> Be quiet as we move down the path toward the highway. I can see the gleam of the highway down there. Uh, it's too cold to have to wait so long, Fritz. We need to come... Quiet. Wait. What is it? Look, are you blind? Down near that clump of evergreens we used to hide behind, see? Yes. Yes, I see them now. Looks like two men. There are two men. And they're looking around behind those bushes in which we have hidden in the past. And the authorities have become suspicious after all. Come, Fritz, let's get away from here while there's yet no, time. No, no, wait. I see the outline of a car on the inside of the curve. A very familiar outline it is, too. Come, move quietly with your gun handy. We are about to pay a surprise visit to one of the cleverest men in the country. The notorious Green Hornet. We'll continue our Green Hornet adventure in just a minute. The uniform of the waves is a familiar sight now to all of us. 
We know that these young women are performing a real and important service by releasing fighting sailors for active combat duty. Right now, there's a new kind of job that's being turned over to the waves, that of a chaplain's assistant. In this capacity, the wave will not only assist the chaplain with divine services, but she'll also aid him in planning and carrying out recreational activities for the enlisted personnel. Another important task the waves are doing is that of teaching sailors to identify planes and ships. These are only two of a great many important jobs being done by the waves. There's an urgent need right this minute for eligible young women to help win this war by enlisting in the waves. Why not inquire today at your nearest Navy recruiting station? And now, back to our story. <laughs> Having recognized the outline of the Black Beauty, the Green Hornet's streamlined car, the two foreign agents moved cautiously down the narrow path toward the highway. Meantime, masked as the Green Hornet, Britt Reed and Cato, with the aid of a flashlight, were making a close investigation in the vicinity of the Evergreens. And this clump of Evergreens would be the logical hiding place for anyone waiting for those trucks, Cato. But what do you expect to find here, Mr. Britt? Well, I'm not exactly sure. Now, hold that flash up there a minute. Something there? Do uh, you notice anything peculiar, Cato? Yes. Needles on branches seem withered right there. Slightly discolored. Caused by what, do you think? Perhaps a chemical reaction would cause such change. Like litmus paper change in laboratory, maybe. Yeah, huh? that's what I think. If someone stood here and released a vapor under pressure from something like a fire extinguisher, perhaps, holding it close to those branches... Yes, that would have such effect, I think. But what put such thought in your mind, Mr. Britt? The man who was in the hospital mumbled about a fog. And then when Lowry mentioned the vapor used to put out fires at the airport, it set me thinking. You think perhaps someone create synthetic fog here at Curve? Could be, Cato. If they had, it would account for those accidents. Of course, the vapor used would have to be an improvement over the type used on fires. Oh, yes. Vapor used to extinguish fires leaves slight crystal sediment. But improved vapor, such as you think of, would blow away without trace. Exactly. The vapor of that sort would have some acid reaction at the point of pressure. So that if the nozzle of the container were close to those branches, it would cause those needles to wither and change. Very clever deduction, Mr. Hornet. We have you both covered with very efficient guns. Don't move. Well, this is a surprise. I meant it to be. Mr. Britt, what do we do? Quiet, Cato. You see, we are all so clever. Never mind that. These two must be eliminated before that truck comes along. I don't like that word, Nazi. We're not the kind that eliminates so easily. Uh, see, Hans? That is the American nerve I spoke to you about. This delay is dangerous, Fritz. We must act quickly. Hey, what's the matter with you? You think I've been trying to find a clue to your hideout just to turn you over to the police? That's exactly what I do think. I trust no one. Then you're crazy. The police want me more than they do people like you. Get some sense in that Nazi head. Come to think of it, Hans, the Hornet is right. He dare not deal with the authorities. Tell me, why were you interested in trying to get to us? Well, when I figured out you were using a synthetic fog to pull these sabotage stunts on the trucks, I wanted to make a deal with you, that's all. What kind of a deal? Sabotage on a really large scale. None of this puny one truck at a time business. Of course, I have my price. So, you would work with us, is that it? Sure, why not? I'm out for dough, and I don't care who it is that pays it to me. Provided it's my price. Don't trust him, Fritz. You may be sorry. Uh, who is there I can trust, even among those in our own Gestapo? Put away that gun, Hans. I'm going to make a deal with the Hornet. Now you're talking sense. Hans, you will stay here with the vapor pump until that truck comes along. Where can we make our plans? Eh... Uh, at the old deserted house, two miles back up the highway. Be there in a half an hour. Okay. And be sure to have plenty of dough there for my payoff. My plan will be worth it. That remains to be seen. My car is at the top of the hill. I will drive around the other way and meet you there after I have a few words with my friend here. Right. Come on, let's get going. I I'd be very glad to go. Fritz, you're mad to trust such a man. I don't like what you're doing. I won't stay here oh, alone. Yes, Hans, you will stay here. Do a good job on that truck if you know what's good for you. 
Uh, more clever than you think. Meeting that criminal has put a very good plan in my head. A very good plan, as you will find out before the night is over. I'll go now. <laughs> so my friend Hans doesn't trust me, huh? First, I'll put in a call to the police before I go to the deserted house. Little do Hans and that haunted suspect that tonight they will be in the hands of the authorities. For a few minutes, we're in a tight spot, Mr. Britt. Yes, kid, and we may get in a tighter one before we're through, but we'll risk it. You really go to a deserted house, Mr. Britt? Yes, drive me there. I don't want you to leave and phone the police. Have them stop that truck before it gets to that curve and then have them pick up Hans with that vapor pump. I'll deal with the other one, but not the way he expects. Turn in here. Other car in back of house. Yeah, that Nazi's already here. The other way must have been a shortcut road. Well, here we are. Okay, I'm going on in. You have that truck stopped and direct the police to that saboteur as I told you. By the time you get back here, kiddo, I expect to have a lot of money for the Red Cross for you and a Nazi saboteur to boot. Get going and be careful. Say, am I tired now? Guess I'd call it a day, Sarge. Well, call it anything you like, Axford. Whatever you make it, you didn't do much with it. Hey, what kind of a crack is that coming from you, I'd like to know? You're too dumb to know what anything means the first time. You always have to be asking... Hey, Sarge! It. Things are really popping and no kidding. Don't stand there with your jaw hanging loose. Speak up. What's happened? Well, two different people phoned in. One call says there's a sabotager hiding in the bushes at the hairpin turn, waiting for one of those trucks. Glory be to St. Patrick. Wait. What's the other call about? Well, some guy phoned in that we should send some men out to a deserted house three miles from here, out the West Highway. What for? Well, to, 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 to pick up the Green Hornet. What? And you stand there dribbling away as though it was just to pick up a drunk or something. Get out, the boys. Get out, the squad car. Get out, you dimwit. In hurry. Come on, Axford. It's saboteurs. It's the Hornet. It's all the devils in the city breaking loose at once. Let's get going. <laughs> Meantime, in a room at the deserted house, Britt Reed and Fritz sat facing each other across a bare table. Now that we more or less understand each other here, Honor, suppose you tell me what your plans are for this big-scale sabotage to have Nazi Germany. Hmm? Don't get ahead of yourself, Fritzy. I don't talk until I see the dough. And plenty of it right on this table here. Get it, and then we'll talk. Very well. I will get all that is available. Five thousand dollars. Only five thousand? To me, that is a lot of money. Huh. Well, to me, it's just chicken feed. Bring it out. Yes. How do I know this plan of yours will be worth anything? Come on, quit stalling. All right. There's the money. Yeah, I'd better put that. Not so fast, on it. Why the gun? You sure change your mind quickly. Keep your hands up. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> you conceited, overrated crook. Did you really think I would make a deal with you? I would not stoop so low. Disregarding your insults for the moment, Fritzy. I'll simply ask, why did you have me come here? I'm more clever than you are. I will get rid of you and at the same time replenish my shrinking bankroll. After I finish with you, I shall see to it that Hans is also properly taken care of. Who's clever, isn't it? Double-crossing your pal, too, huh? So you can have all the dough for yourself. Of course. Hans is getting out of hand anyway. The short time the police will arrive here. I've called them. I turn you over for the reward, and I will send them to pick up Hans as a saboteur. <laughs> They will not suspect me, since I will be helping in his capture. You have a little of that thing called nerve yourself. A Nazi saboteur. And bringing the police right to your hideout. 
Imagine. A skunk with nerve. To them, there will be a good American citizen who has captured the notorious Green Hornet and one of his saboteur helpers. They will not believe your word. That's true, Fritzy. So in that case, I really should get out of this predicament. Of course, I might be able to turn the tables on you. Like this? You tricked me, but I... Drop that gun or I'll break your wrist. Oh. Take it, Lug. I think Hans will bring the police to no, you. No, no, don't use that. I... Yes, yes. Mr. Britt, this way, quick. Police out front. I'm glad you got her, kid. I'll grab that money. 5000 for the Red Cross. How about Hans? Police stop truck. Pick up Hans at highway curve. Good. He'll implicate this rat then, so we can clear out now. Let's go. Yes, sure been going on here. The place is a mess. Look, a guy in the floor, out cold tired. I see him, Axford. You think I'm blind? I wonder who he is. He must be the guy who was holding the green hornet. But the hornet must have tricked him in some way. Hey, Sarge, this other guy, the sabotager, he wants to say something. <coughs> All right, you. Come on here and have your say. That man on the floor, he's the one who planned about the trucks. He's in this as well as I am. A squealer, eh? And that's your Nazi pal. <laughs> Now I'm beginning to see the light of the whole thing. What do you mean, Sarge? I mean about those phone calls and all. The Green Hornet must have been working with these rats and their fog-making apparatus. They had a fallen out, and each one tipped us off about the other, not knowing we'd catch up with all of them. Say, is that thing Cassidy's carrying, the fog thing they were using? That's the contraption, all right. Huh. Let's see, Cassidy. I right hear. Be careful of it. Uh, looks like a fire putter outer to me. Got a little pump handle on it and all. <laughs> no, ain't that something? It's something, all right. Because of that, these guys will hang for murder. Get that guy up off the floor, boys. Yes. He'll be surprised to know his pal double-crossed him. I can't believe this little gadget caused all that trouble. I think suppose you turn the handle or something like this, no? Hey, shut hey. it off. Shut it off. You're fogging up the whole place. Watch those spies, Cassidy. Hey, I can't see anybody. How do you shut this off? Help me, somebody. I'm here, you. I'm trying to get away, eh? Esbert, here, give me that, quick. Uh, there. Uh, Open that other door and let this stuff blow out of here. Thanks for, for two pins, I'd run you in for aiding and abetting those spies. That one almost got away just now. Sure, no, Sarge. I didn't know it would work so quick. Glory be, we're in a real fog, all right. If you ask me, you've never been out of it. Come on, get these Nazi mugs back to headquarters. Yeah, uh, listen to that. I know it, I know it. Sarge, you yell about me being in a fog when you can't ever catch up with that green hornet, even though he's within ten feet of you. There he goes again. Freeze the air while you stand here in a fog. Let the leg free, baseball! Truck stop at Dodgeman West Highway! Spies, cops, Green Hornets involved! Read all about it! Green Hornets still at large! Set the leg free, baseball! <laughs> At this very moment, at a remote and isolated airfield somewhere overseas, there's probably a tired crew coming in from a bombing mission. And standing ready to welcome those flyers home is a Red Cross Clubmobile, manned by young Red Cross recreation workers. Clubmobiles aren't the only type of service clubs run by the Red Cross. Right now, there are 350 service clubs and recreation centers in operation overseas. And it's their sole purpose to provide recreation and comfort for our armed forces. Now, during the month of March, you're going to receive a call from a Red Cross worker who will be collecting money for the 1944 Red Cross War Fund. This tremendous organization is supported entirely by volunteer contributions. The goal for this year is a minimum of $200 million. Please give as generously as you can. Be sure to listen to the Green Hornet next week at this same time. These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit. All characters, names, places, and incidents are fictitious. Bob Height speaking. This is the Blue Network.